Before this video starts, I'd just like to make an announcement. I have the Liberal Tears mug uh, for $14.99 on my website. It is the first link in the description if you want to go pick one up. Um, don't worry if it breaks when it comes to your house. I'll send you another one for free out of my pocket. I don't care. I want you to get your Liberal Tear mug. Uh, it comes in uh, Liberal Tears white with the face, black with the face, white without the face, and black without the face. So pick whichever one you want, and it'll come to your door uh, in about three to five days. So that should be epic. First link in the description. Thank you. Let's go on with the video. Hi. Okay, Hi. so my question is, can you just do me a favor and define the terms and your definition, sure. white privilege, microaggression, and trigger warnings? Because it seems that we have very different um, definitions of it, mm -hmm. and yours seem to be kind of one-dimensional and simplistic, which makes your arguments agreeable, yes, on the surface, yes. but not... <laughs> Um, agreeable on the surface, yes, but not really anything more than basic. Okay. Um, well, yeah. since you're already critiquing them, why don't you give me your definition and we can discuss that? That seems more productive. No, no, no. Actually, I just want to hear yours because that's how your whole... I want to know what your argument is based upon, and your definitions are what matters here, not mine. So please continue. Okay, so I'll give mine and then we can trade if you want. And we can have a full discussion. It'd be awesome. Uh, so, the, so, so my definition of white privilege is that America was founded on racism, and that it is inherent in the Constitution of the United States and our legal system, and it is unremovable from the United States and our legal system. It is bound up in our economics, it's bound up in our, in our intellectual system, it's bound up in all the institutions that surround us. And therefore, individual failings are largely due, or group failings, if there's dis this disparity between groups, group failings are due to these, these institutional biases that long predated the people who are born today as opposed to the, in the fault or responsibility of the individual today. Do you find that deeply wrong or unfair? I think that's very one-dimensional, but can you please go so, on to my question? No, I'm just curious. I don't want to... Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, no, I mean I, I, it's, it, you, know, you can label it whatever you want. I was hoping to get your definition also so we can actually come to consensus if we could. I mean, that'd be more interesting to me. But if you want me just to define things, if I... Okay, dictionary time. Okay. So... <laughs> So, micro, so microaggressions, according to Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff in The Atlantic, are largely defined as implicit statements that we make that offend other people without even knowing it. And they're based subjectively. They're not based objectively. So I can say something to you, like if I ask you where you're from, right? You can take that as a microaggression, particularly if you're from a foreign country, because you may be thinking that I'm thinking that you are a foreigner, for example. And to me, subjectivity in interpretation is significantly less important or decent for a, for a society in which we actually have to talk to each other than objective meanings of words and statements. Um, personally, I do agree with that definition to an extent. Um, the comment that you made about having microaggress microaggressions allow someone to put their hands on them or ha allow someone to ha act negatively or aggressively or physically, I do disagree with that because I think that's taking a jump away from what microaggressions actually mean. So then what are microaggressions? So instead, why don't you just say, that offends me? And which is perfectly fine, but I think that what microaggressions mean, you are taking it another step outside of what the common definition is, or at least the definition that I may use. I just think that we're... Right, I mean, you're, 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 you're right that I'm, I'm extending the logic to what campuses actually do, namely punish people for microaggressions or take measures against them. So you may agree that something's a microaggression, there shouldn't be measures against it. I'm suggesting that we come to an agreement now, you and I, that, that, that the language of microaggressions ought to go away, and instead we'll just call them up subjectively offensive statements. Because that's more accurate. Microaggression implies there's something objectively aggressive about what I am saying to you if I say something to you that you don't like. Well, I don't want to take too much time. You know, it's interesting, though, so I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're here. I will step by that one, because I just... <laughs> <laughs> um, next one is trigger warnings. Okay, so trigger warnings are, again, based on the idea that I'm going to say something to you that is, I mean, I, I, what are you here? I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> yes. definition of it because I think we have two different definitions of what all these terms The reason that I'm finding this conversation mildly unproductive is you're not giving me your definition so we can actually reach something here. Yeah. Again, I'm happy, I'm happy to define things until the cows come home, but, it, but what I enjoy doing is actually figuring out, if you think I'm wrong, you tell me where I'm wrong and then we can discuss where I'm wrong or not. That seems more productive to me. Wouldn't it be more productive to you? I mean, as opposed to me just saying. Okay, so you? it would be more productive, but this is a lot. Oh, it's a lot more people. I want to speak. Let's 
We have a long line. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about it. So thank you. I mean, yeah, and I'm happy. Again, folks, if you if you want to email me, I'll, if, if you want to email my email address, if you want to have these discussions at more length, is bshapiro at dailywire.com. I'm always happy to have long conversations as time permits. To arguments to conservatives, right? That's the argument they've made to conservatives about sex and about drugs. And my view is I don't care what you do sexually. I don't care what you do as far as drugs. I do care if you start trying to you know, tell me I can't say certain things that I am certainly allowed to say and that are well within the mainstream of public opinion, by the way. So how do, so. How does this translate into elections? Does this net, does this atmosphere that exists now, does this help Republicans, does it hurt Republicans? I mean, this, this helps Republicans. I mean, the, the, it's become cliche at this point to point to, you know, Antifa and say, this is why Trump, but this is why Trump. I mean, the fact, <laughs> is that, the fact is that Trump was a reactionary force. A lot of people looked at the left. They said they're awful, they're violent, they're over the top, and we're going to react to that by electing somebody who is not going to tell us that we're the bad guys in this particular scenario. I think that Trump was much more a reaction to the left than he was an embodiment of conservatism. That has its upside. It also has its downside. I think that the, the upside is that you actually have a reaction to the left. The downside to that is that people mistake anti-left for conservative, and these are not the same thing. Just because you oppose the left or just because, more importantly, the left opposes you, does not mean that you're actually promulgating conservative ideas. I think that holds true for Trump. I think that holds true for Milo. I think that holds true for a lot of people the right has sort of embraced as reactionary forces to battle the left without examining whether these people are actually promulgating conservative ideas or even have read the Constitution. So I was reading through you. You did a Reddit AMA the other day. Mm -hmm. and I was reading through some of that. And you and I actually have something interesting in common in that in 2011, you Aside and I... Aside from the beard. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you and I were both actually fans of Donald Trump in 2011 in a certain way, and, mm -hmm. and that he was independent and he could run. Uh, go back a year ago, and I actually worked for Kasich, and <laughs> you, you were not a Trump fan. No. And so now, what do you think of his first 100 days, and how do you reconcile all of this? So what I keep saying about Trump's first 100 days and about his administration so far is that Trump does not have any thoroughgoing worldview other than himself. He, he's an egotist. He likes applause. It, sometimes that leads him to good things, sometimes that leads him to bad things. So what I see is a guy who's sort of picking issues off the tree. If he leaves his administrators in charge, Sessions, Pruitt at EPA, if he leaves Mattis to do what Mattis does at defense, <laughs> those people tend to do their jobs. Uh, when Trump sticks his thumb in the pie, things get all bollocked up because Trump really does not have any expertise on policy. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. The most powerful person in America, the most powerful Steve in America today is not Steve Bannon. The most powerful Steve in America today is Steve Ducey. Right, because what Trump does, he walks his Fox and Friends, and then he reacts to whatever is on Fox and Friends, and that becomes his reaction <laughs> to the day's news, and that drives the cycle. So that means that sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's bad. And so what I keep saying to folks is it's sort of like viewing a Surratt painting up close. If you're really close to the painting, it just looks like a bunch of dots, and you, know, you pull out, and then you see that there's actually a design to this. We're too close right now, so it's hard to tell whether this is a bunch of dots that eventually is going to look like Sunday in the Park with George, or whether we're going to pull out eventually and it's just my baby's vomit. I just don't know. So it's, 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 it's a little bit all over the place. I think that I agree with 70% of what he does. I disagree with probably 70% of what he says. Uh, and I think that the first 100 days is a really stupid measurement just generally, but what it does tend to do is tell you, give you an indicator of what the vision the president has for the country looks like. So Ronald Reagan spent the first 100 days of his, of his administration pushing tax cuts, pushing for smaller government. And even though he didn't pass any legislation, he set the groundwork and he spent the first 100 days campaigning along those lines. Bill Clinton actually had a really chaotic first 100 days, but he set the groundwork for the idea that that chaos was actually going to lead him to shift to the right, right? Because he wasn't effective. And so he had to move to the right and to the center in order to govern well. Trump, I don't know, he, he never had a worldview. Uh, he doesn't really have a vision for what the country should be. Make America Great Again is a great slogan, um, but it doesn't really explain what he sees as the future for the country. In fact, I, I wrote a column that will be out in a couple days talking about you know, our, uh, there's this idea that we're now living in Trump's America. I really don't think that's the case. I think that we're living in the reaction to Obama's America still. I think that Obama sort of set the groundwork, and now Trump is still living within that, within that framework. He's just sort of reversed the polarization a little bit. So Obama was very divisive. He, he had particular groups that he decided he was going to drive to the polls. He wasn't going to care about unifying Americans so much. He came about and said, you know, Americans can be unified by this big government ideology that is embodied in me because I am the great uniter. And then he spent the next eight years basically dividing people for political gain. And I think that Trump is living in that same in that same framework, he's just reversed it. So I'm going to benefit particular political groups in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and I'm not going to benefit particular groups that, that Obama wanted to benefit, but I generally agree with Obama's basic concept, which is that 
a bigger government is po it's possible for us to unify under the auspices of a bigger government through, for example, a $1 trillion stimulus package. We all like bridges. Bridges are great, right? And I think that that's, that, that doesn't bode particularly well for the future of conservatism in his administration, but it all depends on who has his ear. If he's out there campaigning in Pennsylvania and he's doing more speeches in Pennsylvania, whoever cheers the loudest is the person he will resonate to. If Jared and Ivanka are, have his ear and they're cheering him really loudly, then he will resonate to them. My basic working theory of Trumpism right now is that Trump has a knee-jerk reaction to something that he sees on the news, and then whoever cheers him the loudest because it becomes his top advisor for the next foreseeable point in time. And then he sees something else that happens in the news. He has a knee-jerk reaction to that. Whoever cheers him the loudest becomes his next political advisor. This explains Bannon. This explains Jared and Ivanka. And, uh, and we'll see how it plays out as time goes on. This is the problem with having a guy who does not have any real philosophy of government. So I'm going to take advantage of having this opportunity to ask you questions and get some free business advice out of you. Um, so I primarily run campaigns here in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, there are 28 elected legislators on the state and federal level. Of the 28, one is Republican. <laughs> Catherine Baker. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we win elections 10 miles outside of San Francisco as Republicans? Again, I think that libertarianism is probably the best way to, to campaign in California. I think it is generally, but I think that's the best way to campaign. I also have to say, I, I said this to Neil Kashkari when he was running for governor over and over and over and over. Why aren't you running on crime? Right, you see that Trump ran on crime and it really helped him. You see, the only time Republicans win in blue areas is when they win on law and order, safety issues. Rudy Giuliani wins in New York because of safety issues. Richard Reardon wins in Los Angeles because of safety issues. California has a spiking crime rate because Jerry Brown has decided to redefine crime down and release a bunch of prisoners into the general population and not fund any of the prison system. And quality of life is declining. It's declining in every major city. It's declining in LA. It's declining in San Francisco. You're seeing an uptick of people on the streets because there's been a decline in funding for mental health services in the state of California. It's, it's, he's run this, this state as a disaster, and I don't think that it's out of bounds to say, if you want a cleaner city, if you want a safer city, then you ought to elect people like Republicans because what you're doing clearly is not working so far. I think law and order, here's the bottom line. The, what, what the statistics tend to show is that overall in the United States, men tend to vote Republican, women tend to vote Democrat. That shifts when you talk about safety issues. This is why in 2004, security moms won George Bush the presidency for his second term. And the same thing is true in major cities. People resonate to the safety issue. And it's something like every time a Republican says, I'm going to run as the education candidate, it's like, what are you, stupid? <laughs> it runs the, it's so stupid because it makes for an easy democratic pitch. Okay, you want to spend X amount of dollars? I want to spend X plus 10 amount of dollars <laughs> on, on education. But you actually have the benefit of that same logic with regard to public safety because whatever Democrat says they want to spend on the police, you say I want to spend X plus 100 on the police, uh, and you can actually win that particular debate. You know, it's actually interesting you bring that up. So I was reading headlines today. Are you familiar with the BART system out here? Mm -hmm. And there was a, a mob of... Uh, I, I don't know what you want to call them, but they, they, a mob of kids or teenagers boarded a BART train and actually robbed the BART train. And this was really reminiscent of me, like the wow, wow, as you see, you know, like, you know, people ride up. Yeah, they, take your Pelham 1, 2, 3. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, so, you know, how, how do you take that and, and turn it into a campaign and how do you turn votes? I mean, so, for a, so you want to run for a BART director in Oakland as a Republican with things like that going on. How do you, how do you, that's what I'm sorry, how do you get granular and really get you know, votes on the local level? Well, uh, again, I think that one of the things that Republicans have to assume is that it's going to be a long-term uphill battle. This is not yeah. something where you yeah. shift it overnight. This yeah. is going to be you speaking the truth over and over and over and over without fear or favor. And I think that the, the idea that Republicans have, which is that they're going to go soft pedal this to particular audiences, that you have to soft pedal to the black community law enforcement, I think it's insulting to the black community. I think that if you go in there and you say to black folks, well, you know, the reality is that the cops are out to get you and it, it, like Rand Paul has done in certain contexts and we really have to come up with a better way of doing things. Here is the reality of the situation. Every single community in the United States with a high crime rate has had problems with the police. Mm -hmm. Right now, the black community in the United States has a disproportionately high crime rate. That means that the police are going to have more problems in those areas. And that is not due necessarily to racism. Uh, it is due to the fact that when you bring the crime rate down, there's less areas of conflict. There are just less reasons for friction. Uh, and so what you need actually to protect innocent people is you need more law enforcement in these areas. You don't need less law enforcement in these areas. This is why I think the Black Lives Matter movement has done such a tremendous disservice to people who are living in inner cities. When you say take the cops out of the inner cities, the people who suffer are not the, are, are not the uh, or, or who benefit are not the law-abiding. The people who suffer are the law-abiding. Those are the people who actually need people there enforcing the law and I think that 
you know, that, that may be a hard message for, for people to swallow, but... Before this video starts, I'd just like to make an announcement. I have the Liberal Tears mug uh, for $14.99 on my website. It is the first link in the description if you want to go pick one up. Um, don't worry if it breaks when it comes to your house. I'll send you another one for free out of my pocket. I don't care. I want you to get your Liberal Tear mug. Uh, it comes in uh, Liberal Tears white with the face, black with the face, white without the face, and black without the face. So pick whichever one you want, and it'll come to your door uh, in about three to five days. So that should be epic. First link in the description. Thank you. Let's go on with the video. Hi. Okay, so my question is, can you just do me a favor and define the terms and your definition, sure. white privilege, microaggression, and trigger warnings? Because it seems that we have very different um, definitions of it, mm -hmm. and yours seem to be kind of one-dimensional and simplistic, which makes your arguments agreeable, yes, on the surface, yes. but not... <laughs> Okay. Um, agreeable on the surface, yes, but not really anything more than basic. Okay. Um, well, yeah. since you're already critiquing them, why don't you give me your definition when we can discuss that? That seems more productive. No, no, no. Actually, I just want to hear yours because that's how your whole... I want to know what your argument is based upon, and your definitions are what matters here, not mine. So please continue. Okay, so I'll give mine and then without even knowing it. And they're based subjectively. They're not based objectively. So I can say something to you, like if I ask you where you're from. Right? You can take that as a microaggression, particularly if you're from a foreign country, because you may be thinking that I'm thinking that you are a foreigner, for example. And to me, subjectivity in interpretation is significantly less important or decent for a, for a society in which we actually have to talk to each other than objective meanings of words and statements. Um, personally, I do agree with that definition to an extent. Um, the comment that you made about having microaggress microaggressions allow someone to put their hands on them or ha allow someone to ha act negatively or aggressively or physically, I do disagree with that because I think that's taking a jump away from what microaggressions actually mean. So then what about microaggressions? So instead, why don't you just say, that offends me? And which is perfectly fine, but I think that what microaggressions mean, you are taking it another step outside of what the common definition is, or at least the definition that I may use. I just think that we're right. You, you, you're you're right that I'm, I'm extending the logic to what campuses actually do, namely punish people for microaggressions or take measures against them. So you may agree that something's a microaggression, there shouldn't be measures against it. I'm suggesting that we come to an agreement now, you and I, that, that, that the language of microaggression, they email me all, if, if you want to email my email address, if you want to have these discussions in more length, is bshapiro at dailywire.com. I'm always happy to have long conversations as time permits. To arguments to conservatives, right? That's the argument they've made to conservatives about sex and about drugs. And my view is I don't care what you do sexually. I don't care what you do as far as drugs. I do care if you start trying to you know, tell me I can't say certain things that I am certainly allowed to say and that are well within the mainstream of public opinion, by the way. So how do, so how does this translate into elections? Does this net, does this atmosphere that exists now, does this help Republicans, does it hurt Republicans? I mean, this, this helps Republicans. I mean, the, the, it's become cliche at this point to, to point to, you know, Antifa and say, this is why Trump, but this is why Trump. I mean, the fact, <laughs> is that, the fact is that Trump was a reactionary force. A lot of people looked at the left. They said they're awful, they're violent, they're over the top. And we're going to react to that by electing somebody who is not going to tell us that we're the bad guys in this particular scenario. I think that Trump was much more a reaction to the left than he was an embodiment of conservatism. That has its upside. It also has its downside. I think that the, the upside is that you actually have a reaction to the left. The downside to that is that people mistake anti-left for conservative, and these are not the same thing. Just because you oppose the left or just because, more importantly, the left opposes you, does not mean that you're actually promulgating conservative ideas. I think that holds true for Trump. We can trade if you want. I mean, we can have a whole discussion. We all have. Uh, so, the, so, so my definition of white privilege is that America was founded on racism and that it is inherent in the Constitution of the United States and our legal system, and it is unremovable from the United States and our legal system. It is bound up in our economics. It's bound up in our, in our intellectual system. It's bound up in all of the institutions that surround us. And therefore, individual failings are largely due, or group failings, if there's dis this disparity between groups, group failings are due to these, these institutional biases that have long predated the people who are born today, as opposed to the, in the fault or responsibility of the individual today. Do you find that deeply wrong or unfair? I think that's very one-dimensional, but can you please go so, on to microaggression? 
No, I'm just curious. I don't want to. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, no, I mean I, I, it's, it, you, know, you can label it whatever you want. I was hoping to get your definition also so we can actually come to consensus if we could. I mean, that'd be more interesting to me. But if you want me just to define things, if I, okay, dictionary time, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, micro, so microaggressions, according to Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff in the Atlantic, are largely defined as implicit statements that we make that offend other people ought to go away, and instead we'll just call them up subjectively offensive statements. Because that's more accurate. Microaggression implies there's something objectively aggressive about what I am saying to you if I say something to you that you don't like. Well, I don't want to take too much time. You know, it's interesting, so I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're here. I will step by that one, because I just, <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, next one is trigger warnings. Okay, so trigger warnings are, again, based on the idea that I'm going to say something to you that is, I mean, I, I, were you here? I mean, I, 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 yes. definition of it because I think we have two different definitions of what all these terms. The reason that I'm finding this conversation mildly unproductive is you're not giving me your definition so we can actually reach something here. Again, I'm happy, I'm happy to find things until the cows come home. But, it, but what I enjoy doing is actually figuring out, if you think I'm wrong, you tell me where I'm wrong, and then we can discuss where I'm wrong or not. That seems more productive to me. Wouldn't it be more productive to you? I mean, as opposed to me just saying. Okay, so it would be more productive, but this is a lot. Oh, it's a lot more people than I want to speak. Let's. We have a long line. Yeah, I'm sorry. About it. So thank you. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, again, folks, if you if you want.